So from here, the final celebration, and of course, thank you for your uh, gathering together with a lot of your family. Um, so this is just one thing we enjoy doing, um, and that was really a big event. Um, to be a reminder for us um, as a regional church, the unity we have, so important as it is, so it means so much. So it's a way for us to be a reminder for us of that upcoming centennial celebration. And so one of the reasons Hopefully, to highlight the importance of this shared community that we are currently in now. And to just think about the impact that this church has with all the different groups and ministries that go on here at St. Rose, um, all of that makes a difference. And I will be, just to give you a little bit of uh, insight about what will be happening, it will be hopefully a series of talks. And so this first talk will be focused on our parish community here at St. Rose of Lima and how our parish, as the body of Christ, how we're called to build up the kingdom of God and what that means to be called the body of Christ. And first and foremost, that begins with all of you here, all the parishioners, all the groups and ministries that are involved in, at, at this parish. And then the next talk, I'll be moving on to a little bit about the history. You know, part of the church is it's the people of God, but it's also the buildings and the, the architecture and the art um, as part of the church, part, part, part of that tradition in which we share in our Catholic faith. And so our, my next talk will be kind of talking about the origins of St. Rose of Lima and kind of the first, the way this uh, church was first built. When I first got here at St. Rose of Lima, uh, Father Miguel, he showed me a little pamphlet, of, you know, a brochure of kind of the beginning of St. Rose of Lima. And there's a lot of fascinating information in there and I, I got to learn about the way the church is built. And you often see, if you notice, we're kind of shaped as a trapezoid, it looks like, when you look at the church. And actually, that's meant to mimic the tabernacle. And so I'll be talking about what that means, why that early vision of St. Rose of Lima as being established here in Chula Vista. And so I'll go on to talk about that. And then my third talk will be about um, those leaders of the parish community, those priests and the clergy who have dedicated their time and their efforts to being present here. And so part of that, I'll share my own experience of being here at St. Rose Lima. You know, I grew up in Chula Vista, so St. Rose has made an impact in my life, and so I'll share a, bit, a little bit about that. And hopefully I'll have a guest speaker, Dan Holgren, um, will give a little bit of his, his own talk about um, his vocation story. And part of that is to highlight the importance that not only the parishioners have, but the leaders, the priests, and the clergy who are, have led this community over the past 100 years. And so it's to give appreciation and a recognition of, the, of those pastors who have pastored this, this, the people here at St. Rose of Lima. So all of that is, you know, as a way for us to think about St. Rose and hopefully a new light and to appreciate the impact that this community has had. Hopefully this talk won't be too long. I just want to, I'll make it short, as short as possible. Um, but I want to begin with one of the things in which we profess every week when we come to Mass. It's the Creed, right? Every week when we come to Mass on, on Sunday, we profess the Nicene Creed. And we say it every week, and part of that Creed, it, it c contains the core of our beliefs. It professes uh, what we hold firm as our foundation. And in part of that Creed, we say, we believe in one holy Catholic an apostolic church. To think about what that means to be one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we call, we call those the marks of the church. And you'll hear that over and over again. If you look at the catechism, the catechism is kind of broken down um, into the creed, and it goes through the creed. And one of the big sections in that is recognizing the importance of the church. And so, of course, we know the church is one, right? We are, univer we are one people. We are one body, and so we gather together as a community. And then we are holy, right? The church is holy. Holy means it's set apart from all the rest, right? It's set apart distinct from the world around us. And so we're declared holy. That's why we have different holy things. And when we have holy water, right, it's distinct from just basic, regular water, right? But it has a purpose in itself. We have holy vessels, right? When we celebrate the Mass, we use chalices and and different linens, and those are declared holy because they are set apart for a specific reason. And in the same way, saints and us who are called to live a holy life, 
We are called to live a life set apart for Christ. And so we are called holy. We are called Catholic, meaning that we are universal, right? It's a universal church as a root of that word Catholic. But again, it's a reminder for us that wherever we go, right, we can find a place to worship as a community together. It, it includes everybody, from the poor to the rich, from those in the United States to those in Europe. It's, it's a universal church. And then we are declared apostolic. Apostolic in recognition of those first uh, disciples, those first apostles who set the foundation of our church, right? Those first leaders in this church. But then we are called a church, right? We call it a church. But what does that word actually mean, church? It comes from the Greek ecclesia. And basically that word ecclesia, you know, it's, it's ecclesial, right? And it means a gathering together, the gathering of an assembly. And so we see this term used over and over in the New Testament, and it describes often that local congregation of the early church. It signifies the people that assembled together in worship. And so we see it a lot in the letters of St. Paul. He talks about this early church. You see it in the Acts of the Apostles, um, what that early church looked like, and how those members of the community sought to express their faith in worship and in gathering together and sharing meals together and sharing charity and evangelizing to the rest of the world. So the concept of the Catholic Church is one that begins with Christ. It begins with the disciples who followed. The church is a continuation of that same uh, tradition. It's a continuation of those same disciples who personally knew and experienced Christ in their life. I thought it was kind of funny once I was, I once saw this video about, there was a guy who was asking, he was asking Siri a bunch of different questions, right? And so part of his, this video was him asking Siri, you know, who founded the Mormon church? And it goes on. And it says, who founded, you know, the Protestant church? It goes on. And it says, who founded the Catholic church? What does it say? Jesus Christ, right? I think that's a unique thing that we can say from the Catholic Church, that we were founded by Jesus Christ, right? And there's a great beauty in that, right? And it's an important thing for us. But one thing I want to get across in this talk, and hopefully to change our understanding of what I mean when we say the church. I think often when we talk about the church, it becomes sort of a foreign entity, right? We think about the hierarchical church, right? We think about the Pope, we think about cardinals and bishops, and it becomes something foreign to us, right? We often think about some of the problems in the church in the same sense we think of those priests and bishops. And unfortunately, we see the reality of sin, even with priests and bishops, and so it becomes something distinct, right? It becomes something foreign, it becomes its own organization apart from us. And this is why people will often say, maybe you've heard it before, they'll say, you know, well, I'm Christian, but I'm not really religious. Or I'm Christian, but I don't, I don't like the church. And so it becomes part of that mentality of us that the church is something distinct from who we are. But the reality of that is it's, there's a, something wrong about that, to think that the church is separate from who we are. Because as we see, the church is declared over and over again as the people of God. We are part of that. We are members of that same body. And so when we talk about the church, we include ourselves in part of that. And so again, I think it's important for us to change our mentality or to maybe have a new perspective on the way we view the church and the way we view our own parish community, with the way we view our own participation in that. With this presentation, I hopefully hope to highlight what that parish community means what it means to be a people of God, what it means for us to be the body of Christ, and what it means for us to be a part of that church. You often hear that the church is called the living body of Christ. So how is the church the living body of Christ? In one of the homilies Pope Francis gave, he talked about all too often, Catholics do not understand what it means to belong to Christ, what it means for Jesus to be the head and we to be members of the body, the church. Right? As Christians, we're called 
and members of that church, members of that body. So the reality of being part of the body of Christ should transform the way we live our lives. And Pope Francis often speaks about this. He talks about us as a community. It should be a unitive, you know, it's, it's, we're not isolated from the rest of the world, but we live as members of this community together. And the early Christians, they believed too that they believed to belong to Jesus was to belong to his church. They are two and the same thing. Every, even the early church fathers, they often talked and they wrote about the church as a participation in the body of Christ. The Second Vatican Council, there's a great um, document called Lumen Gentium by uh, Pope Paul VI. And if you have time, a lot of my talk will come, will draw from that document from Lumen Gentium. And it talks about, first, the first chapter is dedicated to the mystery of the church and what that means. And the second chapter, and it kind of flows from the first, it talks about the people of God, right? Because when we talk about the mystery of the church, it leads us to talk about who we are as a people of God. But again, all of this, it's when we talk about who we are, the body of Christ, the mystical body of Christ, the one body, right? Ultimately, this is founded not by just tradition, but we see it in Scripture. St. Paul talks about it over and over. And so we are, it's founded in the Bible, what we profess, what we say in our creed. It comes from Scripture itself. St. Paul, most importantly, he had the biggest impact and contribution to our understanding of the church. St. Paul, maybe some of you remember St. Paul and is on the road to Damascus, right? There's that great scene of St. Paul as he's riding into Damascus and he's blinded by this light. And so he falls to the ground. And as he's on the ground, he rises and he can't see. He's blinded. But he hears a voice call out to him. He says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he said, who are you, Lord? He said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But Saul had never met Jesus. Right? He, had, he had never seen or met Jesus in the flesh. But however, he knew that he persecuted the church. Right? That's who he was persecuting. And so Jesus here in this passage, Jesus is identified as the church and her members. The experience of St. Paul tells us about that deep union with us who are Christians and our union with Christ. St. Paul uses that image of the body of Christ a few times in, in Scripture. He uses it in, in the 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12 to 14. We see it in Romans chapter 12, verse 4 through 8. We see it again in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12, and in Hebrews 13, verse 3. In Romans chapter 12, we read, For just as each of us has one body with many members, these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ, we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. And it continues on. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is proph prophesizing, then prophesy. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. I love that passage because it speaks to the heart of our understanding of the church and who we are as members of that. Right? We all have our unique gifts and talents and abilities. We all have our unique ways in which we contribute to building up the kingdom of God. And when I look at St. Rose of Lima, I see a community full of those different individuals, those groups and ministries which are meant to build up the kingdom of God. You know, maybe if you have your own talent or your own, your own gift, you know, I think a problem for a lot of us is we say, you know, well, I don't have anything to contribute. But first of all, your presence is a contribution to this community. And so that's one of the things in which we can be present, right? We give to the community by first and foremost being present, right? To making our presence felt among others. But then also in, in many other ways, right? For those who know how to teach, right? We encourage you. We have great catechists here. And part of those 
teachers are using their talent to teach, to teach those who are younger, right? Or maybe it's doing a Bible study. Maybe it's sharing your own knowledge of Scripture to share and relate to one another. Maybe it's, you know, maybe you know how to quilt. And maybe quilting a prayer quilt is a way in which you express that love of God to those around you. Right? There's so many different ways in which we can give to those who are in need. And sometimes it requires us to be a little creative, right? I think if, maybe if you have a concern for those who are elderly, it's reaching out to them, giving them an ear to, to listen. But especially during this time of pandemic, of this pandemic, right? It calls us to reevaluate things, to, to see, you know, ways in which we can give back to our community. One of, our, one of the great things here at St. Rose of Lima is we also have our, our school here. And part of our, our school is they do different things throughout the community. And so they go and they visit, you know, the elderly. They write thank you cards to, to different people. And one of the things that they're working on right now is to, to give thanks to those first responders in the hospital here at Scripps. You know, at Scripps right now, it has a COVID floor and has a lot of people who are struggling and battling um, COVID right now. And so part of them, as the children of God, people of God, it's simply showing their support and thanksgiving, right, to those who put their lives on the line. But there's so many ways in which we can contribute to this community, right? The kingdom of heaven is part of our responsibility to build that up. It's for us to, it's our responsibility as the people of God to invest into what that means, to invest into this parish. We need to be involved in the life of the parish. And that is how we build up the kingdom of God, first and foremost. And there are a lot of different ways, again, which we can do that, right? I'll share a little bit of my own personal experience. When I was first kind of rediscovering my faith, you know, I thought about, you know, I saw the church, and I was never really involved in the church, to be honest. Um, I went to confirmation classes, and that was kind of, I did what I had to do for religious education. And that was pretty much my involvement. After I was confirmed, I kind of just left, left away and left, wasn't very involved. You know, I would still come to Mass, but that was the extent of my participation in the church. But then when I rediscovered my faith and I, I began to grow an appreciation of my own faith, I was looking for ways to get involved, right? And there's so many different ways, so many different ministries. One of the first things I did was join the Knights of Columbus because that was just, I saw the Knights around. There were men who were always standing around with their blue shirts and, you know, I saw them. I didn't really know what they did, um, but I had a distinct memory of seeing them around the parish. And so I thought, well, here, here's a group of men who, you know, are, are trying to give back to the community. So I just, I just joined the Knights, you know, I was like the youngest guy there <laughs> at the Knights of Columbus meetings. But, you know, I, I, I saw it as a way to get, be involved. And then I saw, I joined Eucharistic ministry. You know, I saw, it's like, wow, be, what a great gift it is to be a minister of the Eucharist, to distribute the communion to those who are yearning for the body of Christ. And maybe that's a desire that you have right now. Maybe, what, maybe that's a calling for you. But when I was first became a Eucharistic minister, you know, I was a little bit afraid. You know, I didn't know what it often entailed. But I started to realize there I was, you know, handing the body of Christ to someone who was old, to someone who was young, to those who were my own age. And it kind of made an impact on me to hand the body of Christ and to be a minister in that way. And again, those are just small ways in which we get involved. Again, here, after I started getting more involved, I, I wanted to do more, right? So I actually came here to St. Rose Lima and got involved in youth ministry. And I saw those kids who were yearning for something more in their life, right? They were yearning for something, a deeper connection to God. And honestly, they inspired me. They probably had a stronger faith than I did at that time. But again, part of that ministry was, was encountering people where they are. Then there was little things like feeding the homeless, you know. I remember uh, Precious Blood, they used to have soup kitchens that they would distribute um, food for the homeless. I think it was every Friday. And so it was just simple things like that of just going and helping feed the homeless. You know, but all those things are ways in which we become part of the community. Ways in which we are called to build up the kingdom of God. And here at St. Rose of Lima, it's no different, right? There's so many different ministries for us to get involved in. 
Of course, things are a bit different during this pandemic. A lot of things we can't do at this time. But again, to be creative, to think about, you know, what is it that we want to contribute? You know, a lot of times, again, I think we, we feel that we have nothing to contribute. Or maybe that there's not a ministry or group here that piques our interest. Well, then I say, you know, start your own group, right? If you want to, maybe if you feel like a particular devotion to helping those grieve the loss of a loved one, right? We have bereavement groups for those who help comfort those who have just lost a loved one. But whatever it is, you know, to find whatever sparks your interest, whatever you feel God calling you to do, and become involved. Because that's what being part of a community, that's what being part of the body of Christ means. And as well, as we talk about ministries, I think in my own experience, you know, there's different ministries that come up in the church. And it's important to be involved because ultimately that's kind of the blood of the parish, right? To be involved at the parish level. But we see different ministries come and go, right? And that's kind of part of the practice too, right? Ministries pop up and they serve the community at their time, but then they also fade away. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? We see often religious communities do exactly that. They have a charism or a certain devotion to serving a certain, maybe it's teaching. And so they teach in an area, and once that area, you know, doesn't need them anymore, they go off to somewhere else. But again, even to not be discouraged when we try to start something new, right? Starting something new often isn't received very well, right? But again, to continue on, you know, it's the smart start in little ways, in the little ways in which we could contribute. Pope Francis often also talks, when he talks about the body of Christ, he talks about us as a people of God being united to one another. He explains unity is a grace that we must ask of the Lord so he may save us from the temptations of division, from the eternal, internal struggles, and from selfishness, and from gossip. He continues on, he says, Dear brothers and sisters, let us ask God to help us to be members of the body of Christ, to be the body of the church, always deeply united to Christ. Help us not to hurt the body of Christ with our own conflicts, our divisions, selfishness, but help us to be living members bound to each other by a single power, that of love, which the Holy Spirit pours into our hearts. And again, here we see Pope Francis talk about us as being part of that community. It's being united to one another. Charity should always be our motivation when we come to church, you know? And of course, maybe some of you have had an experience when you come to a church of not being maybe welcomed or not being greeted, right? You feel, when we come to church, we wanna feel welcomed, right? But part of that is us as a community to be welcoming to those who come. And maybe that's the way in which we contribute to building up the kingdom of God. But again, to be involved in whatever way it is. I'll share a story with you that I, it's an experience that I once had with a volunteer who was here, not here, this is a, a different church, I'm not talking about St. Rose of Lima, but I had this encounter with the sacristan. And the sacristan is, is one of the persons who helps set up the altar and they set up the vessels before masses. Um, but there's this old lady who was, she was, she was a sacristan at this parish and she was there for I don't know, 50 years and she had, done, she had been the sacristan for all that time there. And she, you know, the sacristy was her kind of domain. And it was funny to see her function because she, she knew what needed to be done. She knew, you know, she had been doing that for, for years and years. And so when people would come, you know, there was a young person who wanted to get involved and she wanted to help and be a sacristan. So she volunteered. And then this lady, you know, she, she kind of said, no, don't do that. You know, this is my area. And I, I, saw, I got to see the sacristan kind of be dismissive to this person trying to learn what it meant to be a sacristan. And I saw this lady, you know, I, I had to talk to her and, you know, I had to explain, you know, we're volunteering here, you know, we're, we're contributing to this parish community. And part of that parish community is welcoming and teaching those who come as well, right? And so that part, that also has to be part of our mentality when we volunteer, 
when we do different, when we're involved in different groups, right? Many times when we're involved with groups, you know, or different ministries, there's always, we don't always see eye to eye, right? There's always going to be that conflict. But as Pope Francis says, you know, to let those conflicts and those, those sources of division, let those go aside. Look at your motivation of why you're here to begin with. You're here to serve God. You're here to serve your brothers and sisters. And so, again, I think that what Pope Francis is saying, you know, it's a, it's a great reminder for us. You know, when we, when we volunteer, when we come to church, to look at our motivation behind things. You know, do we feel territorial? Do we feel like we know what's best? Or are we willing in, to step aside in humility to show someone who is trying to learn the ropes, someone who is maybe coming to our parish community for the first time, you know, those are ways in which we are challenged to, to grow and to be a welcoming parish. Here at St. Rose of Lima, I think, you know, St. Rose is a great community and it's a great way for us to, to see what it's like to model charity. And I'm not just saying that because I'm assigned here, but I honestly believe that here at St. Rose of Lima, there's so many different groups who, uh, who are really concerned about the needs for others. If you just look at our social outreach program, that's one of the things here at St. Rose of Lima that I was most impressed by, actually, was here we serve so many people in our community, those who are homeless, those who um, go without food, those who are trying to make their ends meet. And so our social outreach program is a great way um, for us to be involved, to help those who are in need. If you look at our bulletin over the past um, few weeks, um, we've been putting together a kind of a history of St. Rose of Lima going through, you know, the last hundred years and the impact that St. Rose has had in this community and what Chula Vista used to be like a hundred years ago, right? So it's very different than how it is now, right? But there's some, you know, I only remember the last 30 years or so, <laughs> not even that, but there's so much history behind those, those hundred years. There was a, I just got a, actually a, a letter from a parishioner who was here for, I think she was here for about um, 80 years, so for, for about, from about the start, you know, and she, I, she told me, she, I gave her a call and she just expressed to me, you know, that she's been a part of this community for 80 years, and I thought, wow, like, this is a person who has been involved in this parish for so long, and who got to see the changes which happened here, you know, the priests that come and go, the different ministries that get established and go, um, but part of that, you know, it's, it's being part of that community, being involved in it. And I, I can tell when she was talking about St. Rose of Lima, she felt invested into this community. And I thought how beautiful that was that she was invested, that she felt that St. Rose was a part of her family. And, you know, and that's part of what it should be, hopefully, for us. You know, it's not just a parish, but it's a community. And hopefully we invest ourselves in different ways so that we can feel that. You know, we're, hopefully we have, you know, whether, it's, whether or not it's being involved in different groups, you know, that's a great way for us to get involved. Or maybe it's just, you know, saying hi to a familiar face when you come to Mass on Sunday, right? Maybe it's introducing yourself or welcoming somebody. Or maybe it's, you know, pulling up a chair for someone who is looking for a place to sit. But whatever it is, you know, I think it's, it's a great way for us to see the importance of this community here at St. Rose of Lima. I think a good litmus, te a litmus test for a parish to see if it's doing well is to ask if this parish did not exist or if it was closed, would it make a difference? Would it make a difference if St. Rose of Lima wasn't here? And when I look at the community around us, I can say that I think St. Rose has made an impact in this community, right? I look at the school here, you know, and I see all the children who come to school who are you know, who share time together, they meet their friends here, they learn about their own faith. Um, but part of that, you know, just the education of children. I see families and friends who gather here for different events, who share meals together. For me, this parish has made a difference. And to be honest, for me personally, I probably wouldn't be a priest if it wasn't for St. Rosa Lima. You know, St. Rosa Lima, as I mentioned, is one of the places where I first got involved. There was different ministries where I felt I can, I can turn to. There was a young adult group here at St. Rosa Lima uh, years back. And at the time, there wasn't many young adult ministries going on. 
And so that was one of the ways in which I felt you know, welcomed. I felt like I had an outlet to share my faith to those around me. But again, it's important for us to see the impact that St. Rose has had over the last hundred years, right? And it's a pretty incredible thing to think about. St. Paul, he will often talk about the body of Christ in his writings. But we also hear in the church, the church called the mystical body of Christ. Now, St. Paul never uses that word mystical, but he's describing the church uses that comes it's a later phrase that comes in the tradition of the church, and some church fathers talk about the mystical body of Christ. And when they say that, they're trying to, it's highlighting the fact that this is a unique union that we have with Christ. It's a unique union as Christians united to Christ as a community together. But following the concept of the mystical body of Christ, the church is also considered the temple of the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit is the soul, as it were, of the mystical body of Christ. It is the source in life. It is the unity in the midst of division. It's the riches of its gifts and the charisms that the Holy Spirit inspires. As a people of God, we share that same dwelling of the Holy Spirit in us. We are members of this church. And just as the church is called the temple of the Holy Spirit, we too, we hear St. Paul talk about us as being temples of that same Holy Spirit. And to remember that when we see others around us, to recognize the dwelling of the Holy Spirit, to be able to recognize the dignity of those around us. And the catechism in the same talk about the church, it goes on to talk about the people of God and some of the characteristics of us being called the people of God. And I want to talk about a few of those things um, as we talk about us as the body of Christ. And one, it talks about us as members, as being born anew, and principally, that's by our faith in Christ and in baptism. Right? I think one of the beautiful things about uh, the community is when we have baptisms. Right? Once a child is baptized in the name of Christ. Right? Hopefully, we've all been to a baptism or have seen one before, or maybe remember one. Um, but it's a great way for us to expand that community uh, together. And maybe it's showing your support for someone who has a child. But as a people of God, we are called to be the seed of unity, of hope, and salvation for the world. And the church is um, it's a communion with Jesus. That's exactly what it is. From the very beginning of the ministry of Jesus, he shares with his disciples the mission that he has. Right? We share in the mission of Christ. We share in that mission to share our joy, to share also in our sadness and our own sufferings. But Christ talks about that intimate relationship that he has with all those who follow him. Right? He talks about, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Right? We cannot be separated from that. We have to be united to Christ as our head. As the body of Christ, there is a unity of all its members, which each, each of us right, are called to be united to Christ. Christ is, of course, the head, the head of the body, and we are the members of that body. When Christ entered our world, he took on the physical body, right? He was incarnate. He took on flesh for us. And through his physical body, Jesus demonstrated the love of God in a clear and very tangible way. Especially, we see this in the sacrifice on the cross. But it's through his body which he was able to minister to those around him, right? We see him go and he, he sits with sinners. He shares meals with them. He cures the sick. He, you know, he cures the, gives sight to the blind. He cleanses the lepers. And all these things he goes out and he touches and he encounters the people, right? There's that great image of that, that story of Jesus who wipes the eyes of, of a blind man, right? And he's able to see, right? There's that image of, of the woman who's hemorrhaging who reaches out to touch Christ. And when she touches his tassel, right, she is healed. But part of that is seeing the reality of the body of Christ and what it means to minister, Right? He used his body as a way to minister to those around him. But after his bodily ascension, Christ you know, is no longer present here in a physical way. But Christ continues his work. He continues to work with us as he sends his Holy Spirit upon us, uh, as, upon his disciples, right? And this is why we celebrate Pentecost, right? When Christ sends his Holy Spirit upon his church and the church comes into being. In this way, the church functions as the body of Christ. 
This is the mystical body. We are, it's up to us to, to express the love of God in a tangible way, right? Just as the body of Christ was used to minister to those around, so us as the body of Christ are, saying, are called to minister in, exact, in a similar way, right? To use our talents, to use our time, so that we can build up the kingdom of God. And so we talk about the kingdom of God, the church, the body of Christ, as all being one. And we, there's a lot of meaning behind that, right? When we say we are one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We are members of the body of Christ, and we are joined to Christ in that salvation. We experience the effects of that salvation each and every day of our lives. As members of the body of Christ, we are the physical representation of Christ in the world. The church is the means in which Christ is manifested to the world. And the last part of Lumen Gentium, it talks about, you know, after it talks about um, the church, it talks about the people of God. At the very end, it talks about the laity and our, our universal call to holiness. And again, as I, as I mentioned before, holiness means being set apart. And it's a calling that we all have. It's a calling in which we are called to express our gifts and the love of God in a very unique way, right? When you look at the saints and their own model of holiness, right? We just celebrated All Saints Day, and it's a great way to see the lives of the saints. They're all very different from one another, right? They were all called to holiness. Yes, it's a universal call, but each expressed that holiness and that call in a very different way. And I think it's a great reminder for us of, you know, to model after the saints, but also a reminder that we are called to live holiness in our own way, to use our talents. You know, maybe it is if I know how to quilt, making a prayer quilt for somebody. Maybe it is if I'm a doctor to minister to someone who's sick. Um, whatever it is, it's using those, our, our own gifts, our own talents, right? As St. Paul says, you know, we're all part of that body of Christ, but we all have our different gifts. The calling for us to live out that holiness, it's an individual calling. But it should also affect the way we relate to others, right? It should help us to build up the community here at our own parish, here at St. Rose of Lima. It should also affect the way we relate to those at work and our own families. I think it's not enough for us to be Catholic by ourselves. I think a lot of times we get into the habit of thinking of our own spirituality. It leads to... It becomes isolated, right? We come to church, we pray, maybe if, if we come by ourselves or with our family, um, we come and we pray together, but then we go back home, right? But we, our faith becomes just isolated from the rest of the world around us. But as Pope Francis says, you know, being Catholic means being part of the church. And that means being part of the community. And again, that means investing your time and your talent and your treasure into the parish community. Again, it's important for us to be involved. St. Rose of Lima has been, in, has been around for 100 years now, you know, and it's the parishioners of this community that makes this parish what it is today. It's the people and the parishioners who invest their time here that has continued that lifeblood here at the parish, and hopefully that will continue to be the case. But I think it's important for us to realize that we are the body of Christ, that we are the people of God, that we are that mystical body. We are the church. Again, when we think about that, when we hear it, next time we hear and we proclaim that we are one holy Catholic and apostolic church, to apply that to ourselves, to recognize that we are part of that as well. Right? What we do here, whether it's with our, with our families or at St. Rosa Lima, that makes all the difference. I simply want to conclude now with a prayer so that we can reflect and give thanks to God for the many blessings to celebrate for St. Rose Lima um, for the hundred years in which we have been here and hopefully for a continuation of the Holy Spirit to guide us. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we ask that you help us to reject every form of division and conflict in our families, parishes, and local churches. We ask for the grace to open our hearts to others, to promote unity, and to live in harmony as members of the one body of Christ, inspired by the gift of love 
which the Holy Spirit pours into our hearts. May this parish of St. Rose of Lima continue to build up your